Greetings everyone, this is David Erhan. Today's video is going to be on the divinity of Christ according to the Old Testament, specifically about the angel of the Lord. If I looked at every uh, Old Testament verse that speaks about the divinity of Christ or the divinity of the Holy Spirit as well in the Old Testament, this video will be way too long. So the specific theme that I will be focusing on in this video is going to be about the theophanic manifestation of Christ as the angel of the Lord. And the basic idea of this presentation is that the Old Testament speaks very explicitly about there being a plurality of divine persons within the Godhead, specifically a trinity, right? A trinity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the theophanic manifestations of the Word of God as Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord is a very clear-cut evidence of this, right? So a lot of Unitarians, uh, whether they are just so-called Christian Unitarians or Muslims or Jews, they will make use of verses like, you know, here, O Lord Israel, your Lord is one, right? <clears throat> Whereas that verse is actually going to be important because first of all, as Trinitarians, we actually do believe in that verse. We believe the Lord is one. Moreover, uh, that is going to be very relevant to verses like Exodus 23, 21, which I will be looking at in this video, where God speaks about a distinct divine person and that distinct person having his divine name that God that God has in him right? Which suggests that while there is a unity of divinity, there's also a plurality of divine persons, right? So this video, again, is going to be looking at that very closely. Now, before I start, I want to kind of make some preliminary remarks so that we can set some things straight. So for instance, <clears throat> not, not all cases of the term angel of the Lord refers just to Jesus Christ. Sometimes it might just refer to a normal angel, but in the passages that we will be looking at in this video, um, the angel of the Lord is not a mere angel, right? But a distinct person from God, who also is God, right? As John 1, 1 says, who naturally has divine powers and speaks in the authority of God. Now, we need to understand that angel, <clears throat> both in Hebrew and in, in Greek, means messenger, right? So the angel of the Lord does not necessarily indicate that this person is a spiritual being that we commonly refer to as angels. It might just be someone who does the act of giving a message from God to human beings. So Christ did not assume an angelic nature like he did with human nature in the incarnation, right? But it is possible that he energetically manifested in an angelic form. So this is what Theophanes referred to, a divine appearance of God on earth. So he might have appeared as an angel on earth, perhaps. That is certainly possible. In fact, we have many icons in the Orthodox tradition of Christ appearing as as if he is an angel, right? <clears throat> and the basics of Orthodox Trinitarian theology will be important here. Christ is the reflection icon of the Father, and he is the Word of God, and he is also God himself, right? So he's a distinct divine person from God the Father. He is the Word of God. But being an image of the Father, he has the same nature as the Father. And so he's consubstantial with the Father. And so he has the same divine per divine power. He has the same divine nature. He has the same divine characteristics, Right, And so he has the same authority as God himself has. And moreover, and the key verse for this is going to be John 8, 56, where Christ says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And we as Orthodox Christians believe that he is referring to Abraham literally seeing him. Right, That Abraham actually did see him and that Christ appeared to Abraham um, way before he incarnates as man on earth. So we will understand that Christ is not just referring to himself as some special human person, but in fact, the word of God who exists eternally in his divinity. And again, as I said, this video will be demonstrating how. And before I move on to the Bible verses, uh, here is a list of some church fathers who make the same argument. So this is not just some new academic argument that Christians made up. This is in fact an argument that early Christians themselves made that the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ himself. So here's a list of the fathers and the works where they refer to Christ as the angel of the Lord. So the first one that we will be starting with is Genesis 16, uh, 7 to 13. Now I'm not going to, throughout the whole video, I'm not going to read all of the Bible verse. I'm going to be reading the specific relevant passages. So the relevant passage here is that the angel of the Lord also said to her, that is to Hagar, that I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And later on, uh, Hagar, after having this experience with the angel of the Lord, says, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing, 
for she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. So Hagar very clearly un understands that the angel that she was speaking to was not just a mere created angel, but in fact, God himself, right? And the angel of the Lord himself was speaking in divine authority because he was saying that I will multiply you, right? This is something that only God has the authority to do so, not a created angel. Genesis 18 is one that is very explicit here as well. So again, I'm not going to read the entire verse, but there's a multitude of different verses within this chapter that uh, speaks to the fact that there's a divine plurality in the Godhead. So there are three men that stood by Abraham and Abraham bows down to one of them, right? So the one in the middle that we will understand is the Lord himself, the word of God himself. And we, we see that one of the men speaks as if he's Lord. The Bible says that, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a certainty bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Right? Uh, moreover, in the preceding verses, uh, the, two, the two men out of the tree go down to Sodom, whereas one of them remains. And it is revealed by Scripture that one of them is the Lord, right? Scripture says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And we can see this because in, in Genesis 19, 1, we see that two angels came to Sodom, right? So there were three men, but two of them went to Sodom, which means the one remaining is the Lord, right? That spoke with Abraham. And one of the things that Abraham says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right, right? In, when he's speaking to the remaining angel, the remaining man. So we have various different verses within Genesis 18. Aside from the fact that Genesis 18 typifies the Holy Trinity, we see that one of the angels, in fact, refers to himself as Lord, is spoken as if, speaks as if he is Lord, is referred to as the Lord, and has divine authority, right? So, we can see Genesis 18 again, as, as, it, as in its entirety, is referring to a divine plurality, but it's not just Genesis 18, Genesis 19.24 says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, this is very interesting because we see a very explicit statement from the Old Testament that the Lord who remained with Abraham rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So the word of God that remained with Abraham fired <laughs> sulfur and fire with and from God from heaven. Right? So, we see a very explicit statement in Genesis 19.24 that there are two distinct divine beings. There is the Lord on earth that was with Abraham and the Lord out of heaven, that is God the Father, that reigned on Sodom. So uh, when people talk about, you know, uh, the Old Testament God is the mean God and the New Testament God is a nice, you know, nice Jesus God, you need to understand that the, so, that the nice Jesus that a lot of pe these people have in mind is the same Jesus that, in fact, did the mean things too, right? So there's continuity between the Old and the New Testaments. You're not talking about two different divine beings. It's the same God who does the, those two things, right? That, you know, punishes the wicked, but also has mercy on sinners. Then we have the binding of Isaac. Uh, now, the binding of Isaac is, in fact, very interesting because it has a lot of parallels with the, with the crucifixion, right? Just like how uh, Isaac is the only begotten son of Abraham, who we can say typifies and symbolizes the Father. Isaac symbolizes the Word of God, right? Jesus Christ. And he is the only begotten son of Abraham, and he is to be sacrificed on something wooden, just like Christ was to be sacrificed on something wooden, which is the cross. And in fact, Isaac was substituted with a ram, which signifies divine power, according to St. Cyril of Alexandria, that was caught by... Uh, by his horns, by, by a ticket, right? Which signifies the crown of thorns. So again, you see a lot of similarities here. But aside from just this, there's also the fact that um, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appears to Abraham and the angel of the Lord speaks in the authority of God, right? Is referred to as the Lord, that is Yahweh, right? And provides a ram for Abraham that is substituted, right, in, with Isaac. 
in this case. Again, there's similarities here with the crucifixion as well, as you can see. So the, the angel of the Lord speaks, right? The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, right? It's God that said to Abraham that you must sacrifice your son Isaac. And then the angel of the Lord says, you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, right? So what does this mean? Well, it means that the angel of the Lord is speaking as if he is God. And so Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Abraham himself is attesting to this. So again, when Muslims and Unitarians say that, you know, we believe in the God of the prophets, well, those prophets that they are claiming, in fact, believed in a plurality of divine persons within the Godhead. Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. This is another uh, lesser known, you know, one of the le lesser known verses that speaks to a plurality of divine persons in the Godhead. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. Right? So here we see the blessing of God and of the angel used in conjunction. Now this is very key because the term Barak is singular. So the blessing is singular, but the blessing is done from Two, you know, in this case, two divine persons, God and the angel of the Lord, right? And so the blessing of the angel of the Lord and, and of God is seen as one. And if their blessing is seen as one, this means that they have the same nature, which means that the angel of the Lord in this case is also God. And as I said before, sp more specifically, it's the word of God, the Father. It is Jesus Christ himself. So a created being cannot give the same kind of blessing, the same nature of blessing as God himself can give. This is an impossibility. This will in fact be polytheism, right? Because it will mean that a created being can have the same divine power as God himself, which is blasphemy. But a divine being can have, you know, the same kind of divine authority as another divine being of the same nature, right? Because the term God ultimately refers to the divinity. Right, And so the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, which is why they are one God. Moreover, St. Athanasius uh, uses this verse to, against the Arians in order to prove the divinity of the Son right, from the Old Testament. Next, we shall move on to Exodus. <clears throat> and this is the theophanic appearance of the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. Now, the burning bush, from a typological sense, um, it typifies the Virgin Mary because God's presence within the bush was like a flame, but it did not consume the bush, right? It did not destroy the bush. The bush remained, but God's all-consuming presence did not consume the bush, right? And this typifies the fact that <clears throat> the Word of God remained in the womb of the Virgin Mary for nine months without consuming the Virgin Mary, right? So this, this, there's this typological significance here. It generally also signifies that God can manifest his presence on the earth. And that's what theophany means. <clears throat> but moreover, we see, again, who is in the burning bush? The angel of the Lord. And what does the angel of the Lord say? Well, they, well, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Moreover, uh, the angel of the Lord says, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And remember, who is you know saying this? Ultimately, it's the, it's the angel of the Lord saying these things. And Moses was afraid to look at God. Well, where can God be? God is, you know, God isn't uh, in any space, right? He is beyond all presence but God manifested his presence where within the burning bush and that's where you know Moses did not want to look at and then Moses said to God if I come to the people of Israel and say to them the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name what shall I say to them God said to Moses I am who I am and he said say this to the people of Israel I am has sent me to you right so this divine name that refers to the divine existence of God God reveals that to Moses and who is speaking 
here. It's the angel of the Lord that is conversing with Moses in this case. <clears throat> then we have Exodus 23, verses 20 to 23, right? And this is very, very crucial. God in this, in this verse is speaking about the angel of the Lord, that he will send an angel, and he says, Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion, since my name is in him. Now, remember, I mean, one of the divine names is I am, right? Another one is, you know, Lord. So, let's look at some other verses, right? Isaiah 40, 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So, we see here that, God does not give his name to a created being. So some people might again argue that, oh, the angel of the Lord is just a merely created being, but has some special authority or Jesus Christ, you know, has some special authority as a created human being. In fact, the Old Testament, right, that speaks of the angel of the Lord denies that this can even happen. The Old Testament denies this because God does not give his name, does not give his authority, does not give his power by nature to another being of a lesser nature. Only another divine being can have the name given to them. And in this case, what does God say again about the angel of the Lord? My name is in him. So this is a very explicit verse, very explicitly saying that there's a distinct divine being, distinct divine person, not divine being, but distinct divine person who has the name of God himself, which means that he has the divine nature, which means that he is God. The other verse that talk about this idea is also Isaiah 48, 11 and Psalm 83, 18. <clears throat> so again, to summarize, this clearly shows that the angel has divine authority. It's not a mere angel. It's not a mere created angel, but it has divine authority and divine power proper to himself, meaning that the angel of the Lord is God. Now let's look at the book of Joshua. Uh, in, in the book of Joshua, the angel of the Lord says, remove your, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. Very similar to what we see in Exodus 3, right? So there is a continuation here. Another, it's another divine appearance of God in Joshua. And that the presence of the angel, not just the mere created angel, is so holy that the, that the ground in which Joshua is standing becomes holy. Just like the ground in which Moses was standing is holy. And this can only be explained by the fact that the angel of the Lord is holy. God himself. Then we have uh, Judges 6 verses 12 and 23, specifically uh, Gideon talking about the angel of the Lord, right? Perceiving the angel of the Lord and the presence of the angel of the Lord. And Gideon saying in response to this, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Right? Now, why should Gideon be so scared that he's seeing an angel? It's just a created being, right? But he's, he's speaking as if he saw a divine being. And this is what's happening here. Once the identity of the angel of the Lord is revealed, Gideon sa says he has seen him face to face. And we need to understand that this is exactly what Moses says in Exodus 20, 33. Exodus 33 says, Moses spoke to God face to face as he was conversing with a friend. What's more interesting is that in Exodus 20, 33, God says, you cannot see my face, but you can see my backside. Which is a reference to the face, a reference to God's essence. Whereas the backside refers to, you know, the back refers to the divine energies, the glory of God, right? And you can see the glory of God, but you cannot see the face that is the essence of God. But the the paradox here is that, you know, they were speaking face to face, but the face here refers to something else, right? In a different sense. And so likewise, Gideon likens the theophanic manifestation and appearance of the angel as if he is seeing God himself. And that's what's key here. Moreover, we have in Judges uh, chapter 13, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So we see here the angel of the Lord says, You cannot know my name, right? And he's saying this to Manoah. And then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we saw a created angelic being that has no divine power. No, we shall surely die for we have seen God. That's what Manoah says. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he will not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. So, you know, again, it's the angel of the Lord that accepts the offering, right? It's the angel of the Lord that says that his name is wonderful, right? And this is uh, one of the names that God has. And according to Isaiah 9, 6 is that, you know, God's name is wonderful. 
It's also the name of the Messiah as well, which means that the Messiah is God as well. And Mano and it's not just the angel of the Lord claiming this, Manoah also accepts this as fact. Because why will he say, we shall surely die because we saw a created angelic being that somehow has some special authority? No, you don't die because you see a created being. You die because you have seen God in an unprepared manner. That's the whole idea and the point of Manoah's statement here. Then we have some other verses and the, the, some these verses that I will be going in. Most of them are much shorter, much easier to explain. So 2 Samuel 14, 20, Or Sir Joab did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. So what is the meaning of this? Well, it means that the angel of the Lord's wisdom, right, uh, is, is seen symbolically as if it's omnipresent, you know, um, you know omni, uh, omniscient, sorry. Uh, so it is used as a reference point for wisdom, right? So this suggests that the angel of the Lord is omniscient, which means that he's God. Then we have Zechariah uh, chapter 3. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So the garment here refers to, you know, <clears throat> the, the filthy garments refer to sin and Clo the clothing of the pure vestments here symbolically refers to uh, the cleansing of the sin away from away from this person. So the angel of the Lord here, it, you know, in the case of Joshua, forgives the sins of Joshua and removes his iniquity from him. Now, forgiving sins is something that only God alone can do, as we see in Luke five twenty one. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. So only God can forgive sins. That's what we see in the New Testament. What we see in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord forgives sins. Zechariah 12, uh, verse 8. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before him. So again, God and the angel of the Lord are used in conjunction. So the usage of conjunction of, the, of God and the angel of the Lord suggests the equality of them. In this sense, right, the, the equality of having the house of David be like them. So the glory of the house of David be like them. So the glory of God is equated with the glory of the angel of the Lord, which means that the angel of the Lord is also God, right? A distinct divine person that has the same divine nature. So, the, so that's what we see in this verse. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear and delivers them. Uh, Saint Augustine's commentary on this is that the Lord shall send his angel round about them that fear him and he shall deliver them. But thus the angel of the Lord shall send round about them that fear him and he sh and shall deliver them. Whom call he here the angel of the Lord who shall send round about them that fear him and shall deliver them. Or Lord Jesus Christ himself is called in prophecy the angel of the great council, the messenger of the great council. So the prophets called him even he then the angel of the great council that is the messenger shall send unto them that fear the Lord and shall deliver them. Fear not then lest thou be hid Wheresoever thou hast feared the Lord, there does that angel know thee who shall send to succor thee and shall deliver thee. And finally, the last verse before I end this video is Isaiah 63 verse 9. In all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. Now, uh, the angel of his presence in Hebrew can be translated as the angel of his face. And what did I say earlier? I said that face, when it speaks about the face of God, refers to the essence of God. And so the angel, the messenger of God's es essence, the messenger of God's presence, the messenger of God's face, can only be another divine person because the angel, uh, that is the messenger, manifests the presence of God. And what we see here in St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Being the power and the wisdom of God means that also by essence that that angel of his presence is also God. So these are the verses uh, that speak about the divinity of Christ in the Old Testament based on the Bible verses that speak about the angel of the Lord. If this video was beneficial for you or you learned something new, make sure to like this if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe to this channel to see more videos like this and you might even uh, comment if you want to. Uh, you know, what are your... What, what stood out to you uh, about this video. And if you want to support my channel, right, more, then you can do so on Patreon, which the link to the Patreon is going to be in the description below. It might be on, uh, the, on, the, on the YouTube video itself as well. And finally, I want to, before I end this video, I want to give a shout out to all of my Patreon 
patron financiers. Thank you to the Goose Father. Thank you to Abraham. Thank you, Car. Thank you, Dayan. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Vander. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Giga Chad. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Diet Soul Lights. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Nerd. Thank you, Maximus. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Nectaris. And thank you, Norbert. And thank you for watching this video. Um, really happy that you have seen this one. And I will see all of you in the next video or perhaps in the next live stream. We'll see in the future. Thanks for watching this video. And I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye and take care.